Thank you, Damien. Excellent uh, talk. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Richard Villard from the UK as well. Uh, he's, uh, he doesn't need any introduction. He was our founding president uh, of the uh, International Society for Hip Arthroscopy, former editor of uh, British IBJS. Uh, many accomplishments, so we're happy to have him. He's going to talk to us about the role of um, instability, the role of the capsule and the uh, ligament terrace. Thank you, Richard. Well, Mark, ladies and gentlemen, great pleasure to be here. It's absolutely tremendous. And let's start from the beginning. Let's, what does control stability? And I think if we keep life basic, it's the shape and size and arrangement of the articular surfaces, it's the ligaments, and it's the surrounding musculature. And if you look at the human body, I basically we're used to that sort of understanding when it comes to the shoulder, when it comes to the knee, when it comes to the ankle. But for some reason, the hip is slightly different. For a long, long period of time, we've not really thought about soft tissues in the hip. And uh, in a way, it's always based on the bony structure, isn't it? And uh, we've got C angles and every uh, angle known to man. But basically speaking, for a long period of time, it's been the bony morphology of the hip that seems to have determined the stability of it, or said to determine the stability of it. And on the basis of this, in essence, full, whole pelvic osteotomy practice are based. Well, along comes hip arthroscopy, um, and things may be changed. Well, I mean, first of all, if you're looking at bony morphology and hip arthroscopy, the party line is that you simply do not do hip arthroscopy in the presence of, let us say, acetabular dysplasia. The hip is going to fall apart. Or is it? I mean, we've got here Joe McCarthy uh, doing uh, many, many hundreds of hip arthroscopies for dysplasia. We've got here Thomas Bird doing many, many hip arthroscopies for hip dysplasia and seeming to reckon it is going to work. And so maybe there's a sort of interlink between bony uh, abnormalities and also uh, um, uh, and, and, and stability and hip arthroscopy mate, might have a part to play. Indeed, we now know, and this is courtesy of Philippe Chiron in Toulouse, um, what we can actually do pelvic osteotomies of a sort down a hip arthroscope. Let me give you an example of the sort of dilemma I'm in. I mean, here we've got a patient, a patient in his 30s. He's a very well-established rugby player. That's a sport we obviously play to a large extent in the UK and right around the world. And that right hip is absolutely normal. Go to the left hip, however, and I think you'll find uh, there is an evidence of acetabular dysplasia. Look at that femoral head, and it's deformed, evidence of a past history of Perthes disease. Look at that joint space. I sort of persuade myself it may be a little bit narrow, maybe not. Look at that medial joint space. It is clearly widened. Uh, look at that MRI scan. There you've got a torn acetabular labrum and not very much is going on there in the medial compartment of the hip. And now this guy has been playing rugby at an extraordinary high level for many, many years on a hip like that. Ten months before, he has some sort of injury. The hip begins to hurt. He has a hip arthroscopy. I don't do that hip arthroscopy, but this is the finding. Uh, we've got here an acetabular labral tear of the chondrolabral junction. Uh, we look at the articular surfaces of the femoral head and the acetabulum, and it is decreed this individual may be a candidate for a pelvic osteotomy. He comes to see me and says, is this a good or a bad idea? And my view was, perfectly okay, but in terms of your international rugby career, you probably won't be making it. Um, and so let's have another look. So in we go, we, we find this, we find the labral tear, but we find further down, we find a completely empty fovea, a sort of rounded bit of soft tissue, that is the ligamentum teres, and for those who are not familiar with the inside of the hip and arthroscopy, those two should be connected. So basically, rather than doing a pelvic osteotomy, I do that, which in essence is I do a ligamentum reconstruction, this guy is now back to playing his sport. And so there's clearly a link, isn't there, um, between the soft tissues and the bones. Sometimes one is important and sometimes others are not. Now, if you look at the soft tissue stability of the hip, you've got the acetabular labrum, what I can go to call the capsule ligamentous complex. We've got the ligamentum teres. The labrum. Well, have a look at the labrum. The red arrow is the bony margin, the yellow arrow is the labrum, and we know that the labrum will increase the surface area of the acetabulum by some 25%. It will increase the acetabular volume by some 20%. A labrum is incredibly important for, as it were, spreading the load. We look at a torn labrum. We can find, albeit in a cadaver study, that 60% less force is required to distract a femur if your labrum is torn. So clearly the labrum does something in terms of the stability of the hip. 
We then have the capsule ligament of structures. We've got here, we've got the, ish, the iliofemoral ligament, which in essence is the strongest, or said to be the strongest ligament in the human body. We've got the pubofemoral ligament, we've got the ischiofemoral ligament, we even have the zona orbicularis. All of these have a sort of spiral uh, arrangement, so that when you stand up and your hip is extended, they tighten. They keep your hip in joint, basically, from wanting to pop out the front. And, of course, if you get in there and you do a capsulotomy, be it arthroscopically or be it open, the bigger the capsulotomy, the more you may defunction those ligaments, and in many respects, the more you stand a risk of destabilizing your patient. No wonder, therefore, that one can look at dislocations of hips occurring after here hip arthroscopic surgery, because although it is very, very rare, when I look at the reports, nowhere in those reports is there much mention of what has been done with the capsule. So enter the ligamentum teres, and this is my favourite ligament. Those who will know me would understand. I mean, you know, have you ever felt lonely, unloved, abandoned and ignored? Because if so, spare a thought for the ligamentum teres. I mean, are you telling me that God gave us this ligament simply to carry a blood vessel in a developing hip? I mean, if you look at Gray's anatomy, it is doubtful whether this ligament has much influence upon the mechanism of the joint. And we've been drawing the wretched thing for many, many years. So what do we know about the ligamentum? Well, it's banded. You'd be, forgive me for, uh, for, you, you'd be forgiven for thinking that was a picture of an ACL. We know from a unit that spends its entire life rupturing the ligamentum that actually one's got free nerve endings in the ligamentum capitis femoris. So we've got basically uh, the sense of proprioception and also the sense of pain. How about stability? Thanks to Phil Noble, we've got this. If you put a whole lot of ball bearings in uh, the different bands of the ligamentum teres, and you start moving it about, you will find, when those ball bearings are straight, that these are the particular positions that the ligamentum is taut. Look at external rotation. Virtually anything which involves external rotation is, in essence, going to tighten that ligamentum. Let's have a look at the point of insertion, or the point of appearance, as it were, in the uh, acetabulum of the ligamentum. It is posteroinferior, diametrically opposite where all these problems are occurring, anterosuperiorly. So could it just be, could it just be, that however Im important impingement may be, there may be an element of instability which comes into the development and creation of osteoarthritic change. I mean, after all, we know that with a dysplastic hip, not every dysplastic hip becomes osteoarthritic. Could it actually be that as the ligament ruptures or stretches, so the hip migrates and so osteoarthritis occurs? So when it comes to the ligamentum, I think it's fair to say it's unlikely to be vestigial and it probably has some sort of function. What can happen to a ligamentum? All sorts of things can happen to a ligamentum. First of all, I mean, uh, can it be absent? Well, the ligamentum we know to be present in most of us, not all of us. Um, it's present in animals too. If you looked at that animal there and you looked at it um, uh, once the poor thing had been shot, you would find it has a ligamentum. But if you're an orangutan, you do not have a ligamentum teres. Okay. Some 3% of the human population do not have a ligamentum teres. So it doesn't appear in every single individual. Tumours. You can get tumours of the ligamentum. Uh, impingement. Well, yes, you can get impingement of the ligamentum, and I thank uh, some of my colleagues in UK for making this diagnosis for me. This patient arrives, well-known runner, um, an Olympic athlete, that the physiotherapist picked up that high signal uh, at the insertion into the fovea of the ligamentum. The end result was we arthroscoped this patient. That is the, the view. You can see a partial tear of it. Actually, it's a sort of abrasion on a small little osteophyte there, posterior inferiorly within the cotyloid fossa. We take it away and we convert basically someone who is unable to run to somebody who is an Olympic final. We then come to an iatrogenic damage. Um, yes, you can damage it. It's difficult to damage it, but you can at hip arthroscopy. And you can see that hemorrhagic little points of hemorrhage when we've simply pulled too hard. Then, of course, the ligament can rupture. We classified this, oh, a long time ago now. Different sorts of ligamentum teres ruptures. A complete type 1 uh, or a partial type 2. Basically, if the ligamentum is in continuity anywhere but still torn, then it's a type 2. Here we've got, for example, a partial avulsion of the foveal insertion of it. And then a type 3, which is basically a degenerate ligamentum, which looks basically to the arthroscopist as, is, as if it has no function at all. Well, what can you do to treat this thing? Well, um, let's take a type 1. You can simply debride it. Or why not? 
you can also reconstruct it. And so, let's have a look. I mean, here we've got the empty fovea of the ligamentum that is torn, and we're now going to debride the cotyloid fossa. We're going to take a special jig, allowing us to aim right up the femoral neck into the fovea. We're going to use that jig arthroscopically. We're going to drill a hole. Out comes the small uh, drill tip, as you can see there. We're then going to clean the cotyloid fossa a little bit more, and we're now going to drill a hole through the pelvis into the other side. That can be sporting, and so you need to have your eye in to do this job. We're then going to take an endo button, and we're then going to insert uh, an artificial ligament. You can use allograft, you can use autograft, you can use an artificial ligament, but basically the end result is something like that, where the red arrow is pointing to the endo button on the inside of the pelvis, and the yellow arrow is pointing to an interference screw. How about other treatments? Well, we've got the partial tear. You can simply take a little stump away of that partial tear, that is fine. If you feel there's ligamentum incompetence, then you can do what's called a thermal shrinkage. That is, you can tighten it up. But be careful when you do that. Be very careful, because if your sport, if your profession depends on external rotation, and let me tell you, both those ladies have had a hip scope, then basic, basically you've got to be very, very careful in terms of how far you tighten it up, because you will limit external rotation quite significantly. When it comes to the degenerate ligamentum, what do you do? Well, basically, you treat the cause of the de degeneration and not so much the ligamentum. Well, what sort of results? Well, if you just talk about routine ligamentum uh, surgery, not reconstruction, we're going to find 75 ligamentum tears, or sorry, 73 in 925 consecutive hip scopes. Basically, the red circle demonstrates that in every single case we manage to make a significant improvement. And for reasons I don't fully understand, patients who have ligamentum problems seem to be part of my better group for reasons I fully cannot explain. But there is, of course, a problem, which, again, I cannot explain. I mean, here is an X-ray demonstrating a full dislocation of a free-fall parachutist's hip as he plows into the ground, okay? Villa gets in there some months later with his arthroscope, and he sees this, okay? What are we going to call that? Okay? Something is joining the femoral head to the acetabulum in a way which I would have deemed totally impossible. So possibly, just possibly, we have a ligament here, unlike virtually any other ligament in the body, that has the, the ability to heal. Now, enter ligamentous laxity, and I'm putting this almost as an aside, even though it is extraordinarily important, because really ligamentous laxity and the Baton score is something I think we all do uh, copiously, but how does it influence stability, and what is more, as a hip arthroscopist, how does it influence my results? Well, we've looked at this um, uh, back in UK, and we've taken 35 patients. We've basically chosen a Baton score of four and above as abnormal. Um, we've looked at them uh, well down the line, up until about one year, and basically you're going to have two groups, a group one, which is normal, and a group two, which is abnormal. And we find, if we can, basically, um, that both groups improve. And so the perception that those with ligamentous laxity do worse than those who are normal does not appear to be correct. It simply takes them a little bit longer to get there, but they both groups get there in the end. So from all of this, what can I conclude? What can we conclude about instability? Well, I think, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're a believer it's just the bony morphology, whether it's just the capsular ligamentous structures, whether it's the torn ligamentum, whether it's the torn labrum, or even whether it's simply ligamentous laxity. Actually, instability is much more complex than we think. It's all of these things taken together, and good heavens, I haven't even mentioned the muscles. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>